Flying is amazing. Craig and I had a chance this last week to go down and see some of our missionaries who live in San Diego and down in the Baja in Mexico. But instead of the 18 hours that we usually spend in a van when we take a trip down there, until we finally get to San Diego, we went in air-conditioned comfort on an airplane. And then we rented a vehicle and got to drive around in the Baja and, and visit with 13 different missionary or, or mission-oriented people. It, it was exciting. It was wonderful. So I wanted you to know that flying is amazing. When you're flying back across the, to the Midwest, it's like what they took weeks to do when they were coming west in a, in a horse or a, in, a, in a wagon train. We do in, in, in a matter of minutes. But it's also tricky. So a lot of people are fearful of flying for this very reason. Putting tons of metal into the air is an unnatural thing. If it is not working perfectly, it crashes to the ground at great cost. In 2003, there was an airplane, 21 people aboard, and it took off out of the airport, and it was heading out to the end, and it lifted up its nose, and it was heading straight up into the air as they expected. And the pilot pulls back on the joystick, and they keep going up. And then he presses it forward, and he's trying to level the plane out, and it just keeps going straight up. And it kept going no matter what he could try to do until it finally stalled out and then crashed back to the ground, killing all 21 people aboard. And in the process of trying to go through why this happened, the FFA is going through all of the different records, they found out a very important thing that happened. In fact, this is one of the accidents that changed the course of aviation history. They found out that in the process of maintaining the airplane, that somebody who was inexperienced at it had readjusted that joystick, the, the cable that goes, the small little piece underneath the plane. And so that when the pilot tried to pull ahead on it and pull that nose back down, it was out of adjustment. And in fact, as they had a very meticulously checked schedule of how they were to do the maintenance, they had skipped about six steps on that, on that schedule. Things that they probably thought at the time would make no big difference. And then they did further evaluation and found out that they were 600 pounds overweight, that they hadn't been careful about how much they were putting in the plane so that when the plane went forward, the, the luggage that was in the back was holding it from ever being changed and brought to a level. So I think that's a great picture, not to make you afraid of flying, because honestly, it's safer to fly in an airplane than it is to drive to, drive to the airport, but to make you think about this in terms of marriage. We're talking about God's unconditional love and how that's supposed to be something that pours into us and that we then pour out in the various areas of our life. And we're taking moments to look at these areas. And this weekend, we're looking at marriage. So if you're married, we're wanting to talk to you about how to maintain your love. That the maintenance of your marriage is like the maintenance of an airplane with one really important difference. Uh, airplanes are maintained when you land on the ground, and then the mechanics work on it while it's sitting there stable. Uh, in marriage, you do your maintenance while you're flying. It's like repairing it while it is in flight because there's so many things coming at you. And as believers, we need to, to celebrate God's plan. That God chose to have one man and one woman who follow him and that he leads them to each other and then they make a commitment before God and all these witnesses that they will stay married for the rest of their life. And uh, I'm privileged to come from a home where that's been followed. My mom and my dad are very different from each other, and yet they will be celebrating 66 years of marriage in June. And it's a wonderful birthright for, for myself, and Jan's family was, had the same privilege. And that, that picture that says we are celebrating the goodness of God doesn't mean that we don't have to do the work. We're going to be looking at an important book of the Bible that talks about marriage in a unique picture. It talks about the fact that in the, the book of Hosea, God asks this man to demonstrate for all the watching world how God's love, his agape love, is given to the nation of Israel and how the prophet Hosea is supposed to illustrate God's love to the world. And I think of the wonder my parents have not only been married for that long, but they have worked through so many challenging and difficult things. 
and that they have been a demonstration to me of God's love. That they have received God's love and they have given it. Remember that theme that we've played throughout, that you can't give away what you haven't received. And for those of you who had poor examples with your parents, it's harder. For those of you who haven't really learned to connect to the love of God, it's more difficult. So we want to talk about some challenges for those of you who are married specifically. And then I also want to address some things with those of you who are single. So the book of Hosea, if you want to turn there in your Bible or move on our app into the version and turn to the book of Hosea, he's a prophet that was writing about 750 years before Christ. And it was a time when the nation of Israel was split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom that was called Judah. And the northern kingdom especially had had series after series of terrible kings that had led them into more and more worship of idols, and more and more God was bringing them to account for their failure to follow him. In fact, the picture he was trying to give was how much he had loved them and how they had been unfaithful to him. And so he asked Hosea to do a very, very challenging thing. Hosea chapter 1, let's look at this. It says, When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, marry a promiscuous woman, and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. That is unusual advice. Now, first of all, let me say there's some controversy over whether or not this woman, whose name was Gomer, whether or not she was already somewhat promiscuous or whether she became promiscuous after he married her. But it's clear that God said, go and choose this woman. And it seems that Hosea knew ahead of time that his wife was not going to be faithful to him. And so he faced into that, and he obeyed the Lord. It says, So he married Gomer, the daughter of Deblame, and she conceived and bore him a son. Now, for those of you who are single, let me just pause here for a moment. I believe that those of you who are interested in marriage need to pay very, very careful attention because... Aside from your relationship with Christ and your choosing to follow him, probably choosing who you're going to marry is the second most impacting decision of your life. And the the constant refrain through Scripture is that we should choose wisely all the way through Proverbs. Solomon talks about the kind of of a man or a woman that you should be involved with in marriage. And when you look at 1 Corinthians, Paul, who is still single at this point, but he says, or he's single at this point, we don't know if he was ever married, but... It says, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. For those of you who might be tempted to say, well, this is a wonderful person and maybe they will come to know Christ. Let me just tell you, missionary dating is not a good thing. Um, Find somebody, first of all, who belongs to the Lord. In fact, I would say if they love the Lord more than they love you, that's a great foundation. Because this idea of maintaining your marriage takes an incredible amount of not only commitment to each other, but of God's impacting us with his love first and then being able to give that to each other. So if you are interested in marriage and you are single, let me encourage you to pray about it, to not only find the right person, but to be the right person. So I guess that would be the next piece of advice for you. When you find somebody that you want to marry, uh, we highly recommend that you do marriage counseling. In fact, marriage team has a whole specific a curriculum for those who are engaged. And it is a wonderful thing to get all the cards on the table and to learn your communication skills and to make some decisions. And Jan and I found that, that the decisions you make when you're engaged uh, often stick better than the decisions you make after you're married. It seems like it goes into the contract somehow. If you are single here today and you're saying, marriage is not for me, I've never been married, or I am not going to be married again, let me just encourage you not to tune out. Um, I believe that one of the sad facts about marriage in the church is that the number of divorces and the number of miserable marriages is seemingly just as high in the church as it is in the culture outside. And we as a culture need to come together and say, how do we help people not only get married well, but stay married well? And I don't mean just sticking together for the kids, or I don't mean just sticking together out of a sense of obligation. I mean, how do we stay and maintain love? And so if you're single, you may have conversations with some of your married friends. In fact, for all of us, I think we need to say, when people come to us and say, 
my marriage is in trouble or my spouse is not behaving like they need to. The universal answer in the world seems to be dump them and find somebody better. And I think the answer should be in the church. How can we come around you and help you work this out if it is at all possible? And I know that some of you are divorced. And my goal here is not to add any guilt or shame to you. I know that that is a life-changing and very painful and harrowing experience. And so I just want to encourage those who are still married not to have to get to that brink of, of the destruction of their marriage before they actually start listening carefully and thinking about how to maintain the relationship. So back to the story of Hosea. He obeys God. The whole first chapter of that book talks about him having three children. He names them kind of weird names because for, lo, for one, their name is Loami, which means you're unloved or you don't belong. And he uses the children also as an illustration of what's happened between the loving God who wanted to, to gather Israel as, as a wife and Israel who's been continually unfaithful. And so then the story fast forwards a little bit and we have to put in a few pieces because it doesn't tell us all of it. But his wife, Gomer, has gone and cheated on him. She's gotten involved with other lovers. In fact, the, the situation is degraded so much. Not only is she separated from her husband, but she has somehow been enslaved. And we don't know if it's the kind of slaves where she, slavery where she was doing favors for guys or if she was actually so poor she had to sell herself into slavery. But she is in the absolute pit in her own life where her life has been destroyed. And in chapter 3, God tells him something kind of incredible, amazing, unnatural. In fact, I, I think it's interesting that Pastor Will talked last week about how that much of what God calls us to is unnatural. To, to forgive is unnatural. To submit to each other is unnatural. To love each other with agape love. To put others before yourself Maybe unnatural is not the best word. Maybe the best word is supernatural. That just as flying a plane is not the usual way two tons of metal acts in the air, so it has to have something incredibly important pushing that forward and the wings set just right in all of the parts of the plane. So in the same way, marriage tends to fall apart. Relationships tend to fall apart. That in our own nature... If we are not coming to Christ, if we're not learning how to forgive, if we are not being filled with supernatural love, then you can't give what you haven't received. And the sad state of affairs today is, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates, who has just announced that they're divorcing, and, and uh, Jeff Bezos, who's the richest man on earth, his wife divorced him. And you think of all the resources they have and all the counselors they could purchase, all the ways that they could do it. They have everything at their, at their disposal as a resource, except maybe agape love. And so we want to talk about a simple outline, a simple challenge that God gives to this prophet who is representing him, and then take that and make it applicable to our own lives. Look at this next verse. It talks about the fact that Hosea needs to recommit himself to this woman who had cheated on him. And in our understanding of the maintenance of our marriage, we need to recommit, not occasionally, but regularly. So the Lord says to him, Go and show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. I was reading through this as I was preparing for this message, and, and I thought, isn't it wonderful when, when God bullet points something so that the power of this passage comes out in three words? He says, go, and then he says, show, and then he says, again. And I want to hang some thoughts around those three uh, lines as we look at our outline. If you are following along in your notes, if you're following along on the app, and I want you to think what each one of those means for, for you specifically. So first of all, he says, go. That means that if you are to have a good lifelong marriage, that the responsibility is on you. And you say, what do you mean it's on me? I mean that it's really, really easy for us to wait, to assume that the other person needs to take the initiative, to assume that the other person's responsible for certain parts. And if you are going to say, I want to follow God, then I think that these commands to, to Hosea are perfect for us. He says, go. Let me ask you a question. Do you go 
and apologize first? Do you go and offer forgiveness first? Do you go to listen first? Do you go carefully to bring up issues that need to be talked about because they are, they're needing maintenance in your relationship? Do you go first to overlook? You see, I, I think for myself in all those ways, it's like, when I've had a conflict with Jan and when we're kind of in that quiet time after words have been said, I really wish she would come. I wish that she would acknowledge that I was right about some things. I wish that she would apologize for what I, I feel like she did wrong. But you know, when we separate and we've gotten much better at this in our relationship, to, as soon as the tension comes up, it's like maybe we should take a few minutes to, to talk and to think and to pray. And what I hear is the Holy Spirit saying on my my heart, the same thing that he said to Hosea. Paul, you go. I apologized first last time. Doesn't matter. In fact, you know that convicting song or that passage we looked at in 1 Corinthians about love, where he says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Man, that's the kind of maintenance of cleaning out, the, out, cleaning out your brain where you keep track of how you feel like you've been wronged or things haven't been as they were supposed to be. And because if we keep record of wrongs, then we think, <laughs> I did that last time. I, I should be the one that's being approached this time. And so whoever you are and wherever you are in your marriage situation, let me encourage you to quit waiting. Don't wait till it gets figured out on its own. Don't wait till that other person comes. Don't wait till we have a message on it at church. Don't wait till your partner <laughs> elbows you. Let you go. You see, a marriage is maintained by two people who want to keep it flying. You want to not just have one person that's working on the other person that's just coasting. And so whatever situation you're in, it says go. And then he says, I want you to show. I want you to demonstrate your love. Can you imagine how difficult this would have been for Hosea? I mean, this woman has cheated on him after they had three kids together, after he had loved her. He says, I want you to demonstrate your love. You see, I think we have a problem in our culture. We have people that come when they're ready for marriage counseling and they say, I think I still love them, but I'm not in love with them anymore. And what we're saying by that is we primarily define love as a wonderful emotion that bubbles up inside of me when you speak and when you talk and when I'm around you. And because you make me feel good, I will show you my love. And in the Bible, the agape love that we're talking about, the unconditional love, it really is about you saying, I choose to demonstrate my love to you. In fact, last week, Pastor Will talked about this verse that's out of Ephesians chapter 5, which is all about husbands and wives and how we are to respond to each other. And he starts it with, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You see, we've tried to reinforce to you that this idea of my relationship with Christ, my, my vertical connection with him, my understanding of the gospel, that is going to change and inform and empower and, and help my marriage and help my other relationships to fly. And what did Jesus do for us? He came when we were enemies. He came when we were sinners. He came when we didn't care. And he sacrificed himself so that we could experience eternal life with him forever. So, so we could live in love with God. And you see, when you go back and you review that, that, that our submission to each other, our, our going first is out of our reverence for Christ. Then you have the fuel, you have the power, you have the reminder of why I am doing this. Not because, <laughs> not because she did it last time or he did it last time, but because Jesus did it first. And so I'm going to be the initiator. And then I'm going to demonstrate my love. And there's a, a powerful picture that I share often with couples. And you probably, if you've been here at church very long, you've seen me talk about this. But it's a simple picture called the love bank. And that we have an account for everybody in our lives. This isn't just romantic love. This is the people that you care about and you, you have a, a relationship with them. And every time there's a positive interaction, a compliment, a thank you, a please, some of the other things that Pastor Will talked about last week, there's a, a going up of the account. There's a deposit. There's $5, 10 $20 going in. And every time 
there's a hurt or a neglect or a misunderstanding, there's a withdrawal. And so when a couple is engaged, and I think that's a key word, when they're engaged, they're preparing to deepen their intimacy by commitment. So they do things for each other. They do things with each other. They overlook things like that's no big deal. And you want to do that? Sure, I don't like that, but I'll go with you because I'm putting you first. Well, what happens is you've got this incredibly high balance in in most relationships if they do dating right, if they do engagement right. So you go into your marriage with a lot of in-loveness. And then what happens over time (laughs) is it often goes down. It goes down for a couple of reasons. Number one, life has service charges. I mean, there are so many things coming at us all the time, and there are so many ways in in which we physically maybe go downhill, in which we have all kinds of difficulties with relationships and jobs and finances. And in the middle of all that, it's easy to put the maintenance of our love relationship with our spouse on the back burner. And so it just kind of slowly goes down. It's also easy to begin to be selfish and expect from my spouse instead of trying to give to my spouse. And that, that doing of the nice little things that, that we used to do automatically, it's easy to begin to take each other for granted. And what happens then is the balance drops down and it gets down below the zero level. This is called being in debt. And flash alert, when you're in debt in the love bank, that's when you say, I am no longer in love with. It doesn't mean you should quit loving. It means that's a symptom of a problem. And you see, when you get to this place, the temptation is to quit. The temptation, and I'll tell you, this is where most affairs happen. That when I am not doing well with God, and then when I'm not doing well with my spouse, there can be somebody that just works with me, or somebody that I see at the gym, or somebody that's just a friend. And maybe I'm not even romantically interested in them, but the balance in the bank account for them is high and the balance for my spouse is low. And that's when an affair can happen so easily. And so what's what's the answer when we get to this? Well, the answer often is to quit, to find somebody else, because I want to get back to that engagement, wonderful feeling again. And the truth is, this is a wonderful picture because it says that one quick big deposit's not going to make it. It says we have to reverse the trend, that we have to begin to pour more into each other and take less out. And over a period of time, we will get out of debt and you can get back to in-loveness, I guarantee it. Let me tell you, we go to God's word, which is the maintenance manual for marriage. What does God say in that same passage in Ephesians 5? He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What's the picture? is that Jesus had a downward mobility. He gave up his glory. He gave up the things that were rightfully his so that he could come and love and serve and heal. In fact, husbands, we have the incredible privilege and responsibility of representing to the watching world and to our children who are watching, if you have them. We are to represent how Jesus loves the church. That is a high calling. I think of the way that we wear pants that uh, have rivets at the places where you might tear out in your pockets. And I think that's what God does in our maintenance schedule here. He goes back and he says, husbands, how are you loving your wives? Are you, are you giving up? Because too often men think, I'm the head of the house. That means I get to make the decisions. That's what the Bible says, which subtly means in real life, I want to get my own way. And that's exactly the opposite of what he says, is that we are giving up our own way because we are loving our wives. And then he says to the wives, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. You know, I think he's not only saying that you need to submit yourself to the the husband that God has given to you. He is also saying that you are submitting to the Lord because (laughs) the only way you can submit to a fallible human being is trusting that God is bigger. Trusting that God can work even through the husband that you know is flawed. And you go back and you ask yourself, am I really making my husband feel respected? In fact, that's the summary of this passage, which I think is where it boils all down. He says, however, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So I want to give you just a pause and say, let's do just a quick diagnosis. If you're here and you're married, you ask yourself this question, 
Does my spouse feel loved? Do they res feel respected? Do they feel honored? And let me give you a couple of thoughts about that. Number one, it's not about you saying, well, I do love them. The question is, is are you demonstrating? That's what God said to Hosea. Go and demonstrate your love again. So are you demonstrating in such a way that it's visible to them, that it's obvious to them, that they can see that you love them? Or is it something you say once in a while as you head out the door? The second part is that ultimately we have to get our love from God, that it's not my spouse's job to make me feel loved in the big picture. That if I'm not receiving love from God, you may be being loving to me and I'm not able. Remember we talked about sin breaks that ability to give and receive love. And so it is not my responsibility to make them feel loved, but it is my responsibility to demonstrate the love of God in tangible ways so that they can receive it if they will. If I asked your spouse, do you feel honored and respected and loved and safe? in your marriage, what would they say? And you might say, well, I'm, Paul, I'm married to a difficult person. <laughs> um, let, me, let me just tell you, uh, I, I agree. I think that's probably true. And if I could add that, I think your spouse is married to a difficult person too. Um, all of us are sinners and all of us have a tendency to let a relationship degrade and fall apart and, and it needs maintenance. And then the last part, he says to Hosea, go show your love to your wife again. Let me, let me just read a couple of verses about what he does here, if you can believe the extent to which he follows God's words. It says, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a, a homer and lethic of barley. And I told her, you are to live with me many days and you must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man and I will behave the same way toward you. So brokenhearted as he was, probably with a very low hope that they would actually get back to a deep connection. He went and he purchased her out of the slave market and he brought her back to his home and he began to care for her and be faithful to her. And we don't know the end of the story, but the point was is that he was supposed to demonstrate to the nation of Israel with his life what God's love was like. And isn't that powerful? That's exactly what God calls us to. That one of the things that the world should know about people who follow Jesus is that they love people better than others. Not that we are better, but that we are loving actively and especially in our marriages. I want to tell you, I was dealing with a couple who were having marriage difficulty and they were in their 40s and they were ready to, to give it up. And it got talking, we got talking about the woman's or the guy's parents. And I, I pointed out that they'd been married 60 some years and this wife, the younger wife, said, that's exactly the problem. We watch them. They have stayed together, but they are miserable. They treat each other terribly. You see, whether you divorce or whether you don't maintain the love in your marriage, but you just hang in there, those are not the examples of love that God wants us to have. I want to encourage you with a resource. There's a book that I have read that was impacting very deeply on my picture of marriage and of my responsibility, and it's called Sacred Marriage. And the tagline is probably worth the whole book. It says, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? There is a lot of happiness in marriage, but the purpose of marriage is that God wants to refine and challenge and change us so that we can not only find the right person, but become more and more the right person. And he uses an illustration in this book, which is really powerful. He talks about Abraham Lincoln, who by all surveys, comes up as one of the top presidents we've ever had. And it mentions that he was married to a very difficult woman. Her name was Mary Todd. And she was angry and impulsive. And when she felt like their house wasn't big enough and everybody had a two-story house and Abraham Lincoln said, well, maybe we'll do that someday, she waited until he was out of town. And she hired a carpenter. And when he came home, he came home to a two-story house. At another time, she got upset. She threw coffee in his face publicly. Uh, she was so ranting and raving for the, the girls that came and cleaned the house that Abe Lincoln had to slip them an extra dollar a week just to keep them from quitting. And in the midst of all this, their son Willie died, and that really pushed her over the edge. She went from being sort of fragile emotionally to being just a wreck. And it was the talk of Washington. It was the talk around that, that she was really 
uh, a borderline crazy person. And Abraham Lincoln tried to love her and care for her. And as they were approaching the end of, of the Civil War, or actually it was, it was winding down, he was asked to go and to speak at a Gettysburg field. And on the way there, he found out that his son, Tad, was sick and his wife was going off even more. And, and he's jotting some words on an envelope as he heads down there. And he gave what is arguably one of the best speeches ever given on American soil. And the point he makes in this book is not, isn't it amazing that Abraham Lincoln could be such a good president in spite of the difficult wife he was married to? In fact, he made the opposite point. He said, what if the difficulty of loving Mary Todd was what gave him the resolve and the resilience and the toughness to bring a nation that was divided together and to bring healing and to bring two warring factions back to be one country. You see, God called Hosea to be an example of the love of God towards the Israelites when they were so unfaithful to him. And in an difficult circumstance, he received that love from God and he began to give it to this woman, Gomer, who clearly didn't deserve it. And God's asking the same thing of you and I. He's asking us to demonstrate his love to a world because people want to know, does, is it true and does it work? One of the most impacting places they see it working is in our marriages. Let me tell you, I've been married 39 years and marriages go through ups and downs and, and there are stages and there are challenges to every stage. And we need to keep doing the maintenance. We need to go. We need to show and demonstrate our love and we need to do it again and again and again. I hope you'll take that seriously, and I hope God's love will be shown to the family that is around you and to the neighbors you live with. Thanks for joining us.